What's going on everybody? Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and whatever time it is. And welcome back to yet another video with you, man. A measure holic and ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another faction overview for the divided to pair overhaul mod for total wall Rome 2. Ladies and gentlemen, my most highly requested video I've ever had on my channel is a faction overview for the Lugos. I mean, uh, just kidding. It's for Rome, of course. For Rome. There is only Rome, and he was only a consul of Rome. Ladies and gentlemen, I figure now, after the 1.32 update, where we had some changes to the infantry of the Romans, now is the time to finally do a faction overview for the Romans. Uh, this is going to be a very long overview. Uh, there will be quite a few things to discuss throughout it that will be different to typical uh, faction overviews So I apologize for the length of the video, but it is what it is if you don't like it skip through if you don't like to skip through then I mean, that's just how I do my content. It is what it is. I do of course have timestamps in the description uh, And I'll be trying to make them a little bit more detailed for faction overviews going forward. Uh, I'll do what I can um, and then obviously the elephant in the room is that I have not uploaded a video for uh, Approximately four months at the time of this recording almost five. I believe it's been a very very long start to 2023 uh, I'm not gonna rehash every little thing that's going on in my real life But a massive amount of things have happened to me in my real life And I don't want to drag that into this video to those of you who know what it has, at least some of what has happened, I have posted about it in my Discord and on the community tab for my YouTube channel, so please, if you care at all, or if you just wonder what the hell's been going on, go over there, check it out. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to comment them, whatever. But I do apologize, I never intend for this channel to die. Uh, it will have big gaps like that, though, because this is just a hobby, and at the end of the day, if I'm not feeling like I can do the content, that I want to do, then I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait until I'm ready. Um, so that's all I'll say on that. Besides that, ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready for our first ever faction overview on Rome. Uh, I will try to uh, redo faction overviews in the future if I feel it's necessary, if there's been enough changes. And to be honest, we need to do redo the majority of the faction overviews I've done. I've even made a different playlist on my YouTube channel for the 1.3 and onward faction overviews. Everything in there is pretty much as up to date as it can be. So I really recommend you focus on watching that playlist. The old playlist is still very useful and, it, and still very reliable, but there is certain things that won't be necessarily consistent to your gameplay if you're in the latest patch. Um, so I still think they're all very helpful, at least in my opinion, otherwise I wouldn't post them. But if you want the most up to date faction overviews, use the 1.3 playlist I will link it in a pinned comment at the top of this video but anyway let's get in to the faction overview for Roma now before we jump into the part one section of this video let's get into our little sort of prequel as it were where we talk about the statistics the buffs and the debuffs to the faction however Rome is very unique for many many reasons one of which it is one out of only two factions, at the point of this recording at least, where you get to choose what family you want to play as when you're playing as this faction. So obviously we've got to spend some time talking about that. Uh, we start off with the Gens Julia family. We also have the Gens Junior uh, family and the Gens Cornelia family. All of these different families have their own buffs and debuffs. I will list them off here briefly for you all um, and give a little short summary and then we'll talk about which one I recommend you actually play before we jump in to the campaign map. So first off though, all three factions have the following buffs that they share. They have the Roman Legions buff which gives plus one recruitment slot to uh, all of your provinces. So in every single province you get plus one recruitment slot for your armies which is really really helpful. And then you have the Bread and Circuses buff, which gives you plus one food in all provinces, which is a nice little bonus, especially in those far-off regions of the Empire, or, <coughs> I mean Republic, cough cough, <laughs> um, which will help you maintain your food supplies, which is very nice. All three of the families can access to these buffs. However, for the Julia faction, Julia family, the Julia clan, the Julia clan, 
uh, led by some random dude named Gaius Julius Caesar at some point in history, whoever that is, whatever. Barbarian Subduers is the first positive buff that they have. They have the increased melee attack during battles against barbarian tribes. They also have the Romanization buff which increases cultural conversion which is quite nice. Uh, and then you have the Cultural Oppressors debuff which is quite a you know, negative sounding debuff which I guess you know this is Rome they are oppressors. Uh, they increase public order penalties due to presence of foreign cultures so you really are going to want to convert the provinces you take over as quickly as you can. Uh, but basically they are very aggressive uh, they're not really caring too much about diplomacy with others and they wish to just stamp out anything that isn't Roman. So very xenophobic sort of faction, very aggressive, um, which is, I mean, fitting given their little icon right here. You can see it has a little sword and shield, whatever. We then have the Gens Junior faction, which has the agrarian wisdom buff, which increases agricultural income. Quite nice. Uh, you then have the Founding Fathers buff, which gives you public order bonus from Latin culture. Uh, quite nice. Again, you obviously want to have Latin culture. Uh, political elitist, though, is your debuff. You have the moderate diplo diplomatic penalty with all factions. <laughs> so again, a little bit more xenophobic, at least on the political level. Uh, the Junior don't like anybody outside of the Roman sort of uh, cultural system or social system I should say uh, so they're very focused on making money from agriculture and promoting Latin culture yet again I know surprising right uh, we then have the Jens Cornelia family or faction whatever they have the administrators buff which increases your tax rate which is very nice because that's like an overall sort of thing uh, tax is like one of the biggest things you can use especially in the mid to late game to make money because by the mid to late game, we've killed a lot of people that you could trade with. Uh, so very nice uh, economic buff there, in my opinion. I think you have the Phil Hellenes buff, which gives you a moderate diplomatic bonus with all Hellenic factions. I think that's actually really, really useful. Because the Greeks are probably the only sort of factions where you will want to keep them allies for the early to mid game. Uh, you'll be busy fighting Carthage and uh, barbarians, quote unquote. Then, though, I have the Disdain for Plebs debuff, which is public order penalty from the presence of Latin culture. So this isn't good because you are going to be spreading Latin culture everywhere. Uh, so public order is always going to be an issue for you to some degree. Uh, I mean, obviously you can build buildings to counteract this and it won't be such a big deal, but public order in the long term will be a consistent thing that you'll have to deal with playing as a Cornelia faction. Now, which faction do you pick? The, the Julia, the Junia, or the Cornelia? In my opinion, there isn't one particular family or group that is better than the rest, hands down. It really depends on your play style. Uh, for example, the Junia faction, with an increased agricultural income, uh, you can make some serious bank if you really focus your economy on agriculture. And there is some provinces where you really want to do that as Rome. Uh, like when you're playing Rome and you take over Africa, like the province known as Africa, which is basically Carthage's capital, uh, you're going to be focusing that on agriculture, and when you do that, you'll be making insane amounts of money. Uh, so that makes the Junior very powerful. Um, the Julia, though, the increased melee attack is really helpful against the barbarian factions, and increasing your cultural conversion rate is also really vital because there is no Latin culture outside of Italy. No one else cares about being Latin until you make them care. <laughs> uh, and then the Cornelia, that increased tax rate is quite helpful, as is d the diplomatic bonus, keeping the Greeks happy while you conquer the rest of the world until you're ready to come for them. So, I personally prefer playing as a Julia because Caesar, your boy, right? Um, but that's just my personal preference. I don't think there's a 100% hands down best family that you must pick if you want to have the best game. So to those of you who this sort of video is tailored for, which is pretty like typical DEI plays, you might have a couple hundred hours in it, but you're looking for like extra information. Um, this isn't for the elite players because they all know far more than me. Uh, in my opinion, to those of you who are just sort of semi-casual and, you know, relatively consistent at, in, at playing DEI, choose whatever family you like. I prefer playing as the Julia faction because I like representing the Julia. 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 Whatever. 
Uh, but anyway, that is that. Uh, we spent far too long talking. But anyway, let's get into the campaign section of this overview where we'll talk about the campaign situation for the Romans. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the part one section of this video where we check out the campaign situation for Rome. There it is, the Eternal City in all of its glory. Slightly modded glory, but glory nonetheless. You can see little carriages going off in the distance. Some snow comes in. It's beautiful, man. Civilization at its greatest. <laughs> anyway, moving on. This is Rome, everybody. I'm so happy to finally be doing this. I hope you're all as hyped as I am. Uh, it's funny, though, because most of you probably know more about Rome than me. But anyway, moving on. We are not a one-hitter quitter faction far from it actually uh let's start off by looking at our cities and where the hell they are so we have the province of latium where there is this tiny little village called roma roma is of course your capital uh you then also have ariminum which i've heard pronounced in eighteen thousand different ways i try to call it ariminum ariminum but that there's no I after the I call it I'm trying to call it a ruminum, but you've probably heard me mispronounce it as well. Asculum over here to the southeast, and then the province I mean the city of Aretium in the province of Latium. So three cities instantly in your first province, which is four cities total, which is quite a nice uh, size province. Could be smaller, could be bigger, but that's you know, it will do, and I know that's what she said. Anyway, uh, Rome itself doesn't have any um, resources coming in. However, Asculum does have salt, so you can take it to Carthage, and then you have fish in Ariminum, which I uh, mean, you know, sailor's life for me, whatever. I can't think of any jokes for that. Uh, moving down to the south, though, we have the province of Magna Graecia, where we have two Roman cities under your command. We have the city of Beneventum, which uh, has an army station. Didn't we'll talk about that in a second? And then we have the city of Cosentia all the way down here at the toe of Italy. Controls your uh, southern flank going down into Sicily. And then you have the city of Tyrus, the major city of the province, currently controlled by Epirus. Um, you also have two armies, both of which are in Magna Graecia. You have Liga 1 Italica, uh, which has a few different units in it. Um, start off with a Camillan Elite Hoplite. A Camillan Heavy Spear, a uh, Principe Samnite unit. Uh, we then also have a Hastati Samnite unit, and then we have a Campanian uh, Equitanian. Or Cap How do you say it? Campane? Campaniani? Campanian? It's not Campanian cavalry like the Greek cav, that's why I didn't want to say Campanian. But anyway, you have cavalry uh, from Campania. <laughs> God. In the army down there in Cassentia. Uh And then you have the second legion, Legio to Equestris, which is funny because it doesn't actually have any equestrian cavalry. Well, no cavalry, but anyway. Uh, you have Triarii, a single principal unit, and a single Hastati unit alongside your general. And this is also your uh, leader of your faction, your Primus Inter Pares. I have no idea what that means. I always wonder what it means. Maybe someone could comment that. Just because, you know, I'm not here to actually give all that accurate information but anyway um that is what you start with you don't have any spies or agents anywhere else at all uh you don't have any navies and that's it you're only in italy however you are poised to expand quite quickly um something to note especially for the new players is that this gap down here is traversable for armies on their own so the ai will send armies up and over or down vice versa uh, this is basically a land crossing so really keep that in mind uh, i know some newer players sometimes get screwed by that and they don't know that as far as i know that's the only gap of that size in the map like in the entire rome 2 map that looks like that the rest of the gaps they like make sense when you can cross a river but yeah here we got the tiny little triremes or whatever they're going back and forth, and that's what your army goes on, apparently. Anyway, uh, that is your starting position. But Eventum has olives. Cassentia does not have any resources. That is that. Um, it is worth pointing out, though, that you are surrounded by even more resources. For example, Retium has wine up here. 
Batavium up here in the north. And the Po Valley, I believe, has uh, glassware to the west. Uh, wait, where is it? Oh, never mind. I thought Jengua had resources too. Never mind, it doesn't. Uh, to the east in Lyria, you have marble. Uh, we then have some copper down here, or bronze, whatever that is. More wine. Um, Sicily also has some fishies over there. And I believe grain in this city right here. Uh, I can't remember. In Akragas. We then also have iron over here, which also includes lead. You're surrounded by resources and potential economic expansion. Uh, which is very nice, considering you begin at war. And war is just another word for expansion, really, isn't it? So for your starting diplomacy, you have two wars going on with Epirus to your southeast and Etruria to your northwest. Uh, you do have some other diplomatic agreements going on. Carthage, for example, you have a non-aggression pact and a trade agreement. And then Massalia, I you just have a trade receive. agreement, uh, which is your Greek allies to your west. Uh, you don't have anything else going on, though. No one else really cares about you just yet, although you are quite strong. The other factions will fear you, uh, especially being the player on higher difficulties, you will be targeted quite quickly early on. Rome is a really interesting faction because it's probably the single most played faction in DEI, but it's also kind of controversial in that some players actually find it really, really hard. Other players find it disgustingly easy. Uh, and then there's other players who are kind of like me, I guess, where like most of the time the playthrough is fine, but it can get sort of tricky. Uh, we'll talk about difficulty later on, of course, but basically that's just some, I guess, starter advice for newer players as well, where your experience really depends on what you do, but if you know what to do, then most of the time, like 99% of the time, you're going to be okay starting off. Um, some people get a little bit overwhelmed when you have a lot of cities at once. I mean, what have we got here? Five cities to begin with. It's not that bad, and you don't need to do a lot with them instantly either, so don't panic. Just uh, take your time, take over the cities that you need to uh, quite quickly, like Iridium for instance, and you'll be okay. But anyway, now that we've talked about your diplomacy, your starting position, let's talk about your population, because population is one of the biggest things that divided to power adds to the game and it really really can affect your campaign so let's start off in roma your capital city biggest population in your republic and possibly in the big in the game at the beginning at least on turn one uh you start off with 52,000 people in your city uh that's your population level right there i'm not going to literally go out and list every single uh city and like all of the different little tiers and whatever but I will state that the minimum that you have in a single city is around 33,000. Uh, Riminum up here is 38,000, 34 there in Asculum, 33 there. Uh, just yeah 33,000 is the lowest you go. That's bigger than what some factions have in total when they start. At least for like the one hit quitter factions. Um, but your population is like excellent, fantastic, really really good. The only issue you have is early on in the campaign, under your first reform level, your the units that you want to use, battle. the principes, come from your pleb social class. And the, uh, your pleb social class is your tier 2 class, basically. And it's the class that you can actually go through quite quickly because your pleb units are so good. Uh, like the principes, you want to fill up your armies with as many of them as you can. They're just fantastic. There's no reason why you wouldn't want to recruit them except population and money um, but population would be the number one thing so like for example with this Commander. second legion if you want to recruit a lot of them recruit a few units of Beneventum then send it to Rome or send it to Asculum and recruit a few more units don't just drain out your entire social class in one single city spread it out a little uh, but it's also not crucial you're not going to instantly lose a game because you drain Beneventum of all the plebs. You still have thousands of them in Rome, Asculum, Arumnum, whatever. Uh, so population is probably one of the biggest benefits that Rome as a faction has overall. Uh, you even get some sort of hidden bonuses that increase your um, population overall. And furthermore, once you get into your uh, Marian level reforms, which is sort of mid to late game for the most part, but it is quite important. Um, 
your best units, the legionnaires or legionari, they come from the proletary social class, which is basically your lowest tier Roman citizens that you have. And you can see at turn one, Rome has 38,000 proletari in its city itself. So your best, not necessarily your best, but your most cost effective units that you will get, your legionnaire units, are going to be extremely readily available to you. Uh, and that will continue as you continue to expand outside of Italy as well. Uh, you will rely on the Peregrini, which is foreigners, for your auxiliaries and your mercenaries, but that's fine. You'll get them as you leave Italy as well. Population, one of the biggest positive things Rome has going for it. Uh, and that's why, however, do be aware that you don't have any other factions besides uh, Etruria that shares the Latin culture. Uh, do they even actually have Latin? Let's double check real quick before I screw it up even more. No, oh, they're Italic. They're not even Latin. Never mind. Uh, so you're the only Latin faction. So as soon as you get outside of Italy, uh, your higher tier social classes like the plebs and what's the other one? The uh, Patricii, of course, will not be in high numbers. So if I march out and take over the city of Milan, I'm not going to be able to replace, say, my Chirurgi very quickly. It might take a little while. Uh, but anyway, that's just... Your only sort of negative thing you have going for your population. Now, your economy. Your economy for Rome is initially kind of trying and difficult. Uh, which is funny because you have all of these cities, but your, um, your wars are splitting you up and you need armies very, very quickly. Some factions, you can take your time building up. You can, you know, fo focus first on building this, building that, and whatever city making certain provinces specialize in economy. In Rome, it's a quite a fast-paced game, very, very quickly. You start off in two different wars in two different directions, going north and south, and you don't have time to build up your army, I mean, your cities. Uh, you can try to buy some time once you deal with these wars, but the first thing you've got to do is you've got to address these wars ASAP. Like, within the first 15 turns, you should have at least Tyrus and have wiped out the Etruscans. And so that's a lot of money to spend just purely on armies and not really building up your economy. However, because you start off with so many resources instantly, three resources on turn one, not bad at all, uh, you're going to have a lot of factions that are willing to trade. So I would recommend getting out there, getting the Roman name known, um, build a little navy, send it sailing out west to the Iberians, maybe east to more Hellenic factions, get trade flowing. That would be a nice little boost to your early game start. But then after that, uh, once you, say, take over um, the core province of Africa down here in Carthage, uh, that's like one of the best provinces in the game to take for economy. And then you can just start plowing through money as you're pumping out legion after legion after legion. Um, so the mid to late game of the Roman economy is really, really good. And you don't have to tailor your entire economy to one specific thing. For example, you can make like Italia be all about uh, commerce, perhaps, uh, um, or culture, if you like, as well. Uh, same thing was sort of Magna Gratia or whatever. And then Africa itself will be all about agriculture. So that's one of the sort of fun things about Rome is that you have so much diversity. I mean, they did take over so many different parts of the Mediterranean world and like the European world. So there's so many different cultures you're going to clash with. But it also means your economy is going to be very diverse if you want it to. Um, you could do an industrial economy and pump out industrial buildings all throughout Italy as well. It really comes down to what you want to do and what's appropriate for that area. Um, I mean, if you take over, you know, the heartlands of Greece, you're probably going to want to focus more on either commerce or uh, culture for your income. It just makes sense, right? Um, so for Rome, I really don't think you have to specialize in anything in particular because you're going to be expanding in so many different ways and you need to tailor your choices to the environment. Uh, like, I probably wouldn't focus on, like, agriculture when you're deep down in the desert, at least for money. You know, uh, you're going to be busy trying to feed those cities. But for like really fertile areas like the coastal areas of Africa. Oh, yeah. Pump out the agriculture income as much as you like. Once you get to like, say, Iberia, you might want to focus more on industry. Use the mines out there to your advantage. Uh, so very, very diverse, which is very good news for you, in my opinion. My overall must have 
uh, recommendation for your economy though is take the African province. It doesn't have to be as quickly as you can, but take it and take it all. All of these cities under the province of Africa and then utilize this province as a agricultural hub. Um, use the edict that lets you pump out agriculture and like export it. So you want to export the agriculture from this province and just make every single building slot devoted to giving you food. You will make 10k plus very very easily from that single province super quickly uh, and it'll just skyrocket from there based on how you try to buff it and whatever use agents and all that so uh, economy overall very very promising it is a bit of a struggle early on because you do need to really focus on building good armies to defeat your enemies quite quickly and if you're playing on difficulties above normal you're gonna have enemy after enemy after enemy uh, you'll deal with the Etruscans but then you're, maybe your army marches south to deal with the Etrurians, I mean not Etrurians, the uh, Epirates. But then most of the time the Ligurians and the Insubres will attack you. Uh, maybe even the Veneti at Patavium. Depends on your d diplomacy and what you try to do, but majority of the time these uh, bad boys will try to attack you. Then you're going to march back north or you're going to make another army and march back north and then it just drains your economy. Um, so you do need to be careful early on, in my opinion, otherwise you can sort of start to slip away and that's where Rome can sort of get torn apart in the early game. So now this is a special segment of the campaign overview because we need to talk about the scripts. There's actually not all that many scripted events that occur in DEI and this is one of the very few that does, which is where we have the Punic Wars script. Now, the Punic War script essentially forces Rome to be at war with Carthage. How long for, or whatever happens, is up to you and what difficulty you're playing on, what submods you have. But for like a typical normal difficulty level DEI experience, most of the time after that script kicks in, you're going to really struggle to get peace. Whether you're playing as Rome or as Carthage, to be honest. So for those of you that don't know, the script is basically once you take over Syracuse, it forces you automatically to go to war. Um, it's trying to reflect obviously the real life Punic Wars that occurred, uh, although you did, the Romans didn't take Syracuse, they kicked it off, they took over this little city up here, what's it called, Messana? Messina? Messina? Messana? Messana, I think. Uh, I always get that name mixed up, but anyway, they took over a city on the very northern tip of Sicily, uh, and that kicked off the Punic War. So in DEI, to sort of represent that, once the Romans or the Carthaginians, for that matter, take over Syracuse, that puts you into war instantly. Uh, and then whatever happens, happens after that. I believe you can take the other factions, I mean the other cities over here, but if you take over Syracuse, then that's what's going to kick it off instantly, I believe. At least, uh, that might have been how it used to have been. The script might have been altered, but... Either way, if you don't want to fight Carthage too quickly when you're playing as Rome, try not to get in, into war with Syracuse, or if you do, don't take over their city. Uh, you could do something, for example, like make them a client state, uh, or just get peace with them after you wipe out their armies, whatever. But yeah, don't occupy their city if you don't want to kick in the script. You will even get warnings. For example, if you take the city of Taurus, you'll get a warning pop-up event that says, uh, you know, the Romans are encroaching on the south, Carthage is getting a little nervous, blah blah blah. That's just sort of to warn you, hey, you know, you keep expanding against the other major play in the Mediterranean, which is Carthage, you're gonna have trouble. Uh, so there is a bit of a warning, but it does force you to get into war with Carthage. Whether you like that or not, it's kind of up for a debate. It's been one of those things which has been debated throughout it's history for DEI since DEI had it implemented. I quite like it. Uh, I wish there was more scripted events where you, you at least had options for certain things, like have a pop-up event that says do this or do that, and then obviously they have consequences. I'm all about more events being in DEI. I would love that a lot, so for this to be in it, I'm okay with it. Um, I just wish that you could get peace eventually with uh, Carthage or the other, or if you're playing as Carthage, Rome never wants peace. If you're playing as Rome, I'm still pretty sure you can't get peace with Carthage. Or it takes like a lot of effort. Like you got to give them a lot of money. You got to make them really love you again because you lose your friendliness with them. If we go to the diplomacy screen, go to Carthage, you can see 
starting off, your total attitude value is 98. They're very friendly with you. They like you quite a lot. You're bringing in a lot of trade to them. You're a major power, but you're minding your own business over here in Italy. Things are good, man. You know, Carthage and Rome, they could have had a very different history if it were not for Sicily. Which is funny, because in DEI, Sicily isn't really all that important, to be honest. It's not even that much of an economic hub. Uh, it's more of a strategical position, really. But it is what it is. That is what you have to know uh, for the campaign situation as Rome. Uh, I do have a little bit of overall advice, which I've kind of re uh, you know, hinted at throughout this section so far. Um, overall advice is to really just conquer as quickly as you can, uh, but do some controlled conquering. Take a radium within the first three to five turns. Easily. has to be very, very quickly. You don't need a big army to take it. It's only a village, and the Etruscans take a while to build up their army. Spam some principes or whatever, crit some mercenaries, get up there. Uh, that would be my, like, turn three move. Um, sometimes turn two, but usually turn three. I don't think you can actually reach it in two turns unless you recruit a general here, which sometimes I choose to. It's up to you. But take a Redium, uh, and then you have to take Taurus and deal with the Epirates. They do have a very difficult army uh, over here in Apollonia, which almost always instantly sails across to Taurus. It's led by Pyrrhus himself, and it has mercenary uh, Indian elephants, or African, no, Syrian elephants. Uh, so their elephants are definitely scary, but it's controlled by the AI. Uh, so, you know, you can kill it relatively easily, but um, I would definitely occupy Taurus as quickly as you can, and then try to get peace with Epirus, because you don't want to expand into Greece until you're really ready. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be drawn out into the east while you're fighting in the south and you have enemies coming in from the north. And that is how you can lose the campaign. I've actually lost a campaign to the Rome before. Just one. And to be fair, there was a lot of hardcore submods I had. I believe I was using the uh, Testudo submod as well. So those of you who know that, that's an amazing submod, but it makes it very difficult. Uh, but that's how players loses Rome. Every comment I've ever had on a video where it says that Rome's hard. What are you talking about, you idiot? Um, that's how they always say they lose. And that's how I see friends and hear from friends how they lose. They get drawn into multiple wars. People coming from the north. People coming from the south and the east, whatever. They just come bloody everywhere, mate. Calm down. Do controlled divide and conquer. Use your diplomacy, get non-aggression packs in the north if you can while you're fighting Carthage. Uh, get trade or non-aggressions with the Greeks while you're fighting barbarians. Um, just use some sort of typical common sense and restraint. Uh, and overall, Rome is still quite an easy campaign, but we'll talk more about difficulty later on. That's just my overall recommendation for you for some general advice. We'll get a little bit more specific at the verdict of this video. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the part one section of this video. Now let's go to the part two section where we will talk about the military of Rome. All right, everybody, here we are at the part two section of this video. Where we're checking out the military of the Romans. And finally, we actually have a reason to do a naval segment of this faction overview. Most of our faction overviews, I just do a brief sort of summary of their navy. However, the Romans have one of the biggest navies in the game. Uh, and while I still probably could have got away with just giving you guys a sentence or two about their navy, you know we got to give Rome the special treatment. So we're going to have a look at all of their ships that they have on offer. Uh, not in too much detail. I don't want to take up too much time. However, before we do get started, let's just list the reforms that the Romans have to go through. So the Romans do have their own cultural reforms that are unique to just the Roman faction. They have the first Polybian reforms, which occur at Imperium level 3 at turn 40. They then have the Marian reforms that happen at Imperium level 5, so you have to reach that Imperium level, and you have to reach turn 100. And then you have the Imperial reforms, which occur at Imperium level 7, turn 210. Uh, and then there is basically a fourth sort of unlisted reform because you start off during the Camillan reform system uh, Where you're basically using spears and still the so 
semi-hoplite sort of style of fighting. Uh, whereas the Polybian reforms, that's when Rome really converts to basically the gladius and using the sword instead of the spear and shield. Uh, and then the Marian reforms is where you get your legionnaires. And the imperial reforms is where you get imperial legionnaires. Uh, and the really Hollywood-esque style legionaries that we have all come to know and love uh, in the very few uh, cinema shots that we do have of Roman uh, troops. We need more Roman movies and stuff, man, I swear. That would be so nice. Roman recommendations. At least Roman shows and movies, whatever. Recommendations in the comments, guys. I would love to see them. But anyway, that is the reform system for Rome. Uh, now let's talk briefly about your navy. Uh, although if you are a bit of a history buff, which I imagine you are, you can probably guess what your navy as Rome is going to be like. So this is our Admiral's flagship right here. It's the Tower Hexareme ship. Um, this is the biggest ship that you can get for your Admiral. There are a few other different levels you can get, but this is the one that you basically almost always going to want to aim for. Uh, you have 160 men on, bo on board, or Roman Marines. These guys are basically Roman Principes, which you can tell by the look that they have, but they're also quite similar in stats. Um, however, the stats on the Navy are quite better than the uh, standard form that is on land, and that's something which is kind of interesting about all of your Naval units. Your stats for your Marines are slightly higher, and in some cases substantially higher than the land counterparts however you are also more limited in men so you only have 160 men as opposed to 200 for example um, your ship health that you can get as the absolute maximum is 1600 which is very very high quite nice a very very thick juicy ship look at those textures oh my god that is a thick ship if I've ever seen one bullseye aim for us here Carthaginians um, Anyway, uh, something to note is that the towers that you see here, they do actually shoot out arrows, they shoot out flaming arrows that actually do do flaming damage to enemy ships. Uh, you might not have known that, but they do incur some flaming damage. It's not massive, but it will set a ship on fire over time. So if you're in a boarding action and you're trying to capture a ship, you might want to do it very quickly. Uh, but anyway... That's it for your Admiral's flagship, the no skirmishing potential besides those towers, and your uh, Marine unit has a single javelin to throw, I believe. Uh, but anyway, let's get on to the rest of your uh, Marine units that we have going on, and you're going to notice, if, especially if you're paying attention to the unit cards, a bit of a pattern. Um, we have certain groups or categories of units, I, I should say. Ships waiting. So right here, ships ready for these four ships are basically the core of your navy, especially for the early game. These are basically more principes on ships. Uh, these are your Roman marines that you get early on. Uh, very, very nice melee stats yet again, so you're going to be seeing a very dire need to get these guys into a melee engagement. Um, your smallest level ship that you can get with these guys command. is just 60 men on the ship with a ship health of 500, so be very, very careful with that. I wouldn't really recruit just 60 men on the ship, especially if it's just Marines. Not much point in that. Assault 80, it's a little reported. bit more understandable. Commander. 120, though, that is the sort of ship that you will want as, like, the core of your navy because this has a decent ship health at uh, 800. Still not great, but, you know, better than your lower ones by quite a bit. Uh, and having the, uh, what I say, 120 men, that's enough to fight off, like, two ships at once if it's taking on, like, skirmishers or whatever. Or, like, some kind of low-tier swordsmen, like, barbarian units. It also actually has a scorpion that is, uh, active and does actually get you kills, so that can help out. Uh, is there one at the rear too? Yes, there is. Second one back here. Um, your other two ships do not have a scorpion, I believe, right? just double confirm yeah no scorpion and no towers either so 120 men uh, basically principes on the ship get them in melee combat as soon as you can and that is going to be really the sort of trend for your navy uh, do that as quickly as you can Assault you do have one ship attack. which does have just 20 more men so it's not as big of a deal as you would think but I mean it the ship health is really the big difference going from 800 to 1200 ship health is really really big these guys are what you're going to want to use as like sort of 
think of it, I mean, if you're like a Star Wars lover like me, this can almost be like a capital ship. And you want it to be supported by like your other little buddy ships over here, you know? Um, so maybe spread out a few of these throughout your navy. Not too many in the single uh, naval army contingent, but um, or military contingent. Uh, because they are very expensive. That's the thing about navies in DEI, is they are very expensive to recruit and to maintain. Uh, but they are also extremely useful. But these guys, again, have two scorpions. Um, just a crap ton of marines, so very, very nice. Big ship health. Um, these guys are going to be very useful if you want to do some amphibious assaults as well. Which we'll talk about a little bit more shortly, but... You have four of these different little uh, principe units you can get in addition to your admiral so do keep that in mind however Proud Romans we then jump on to these bad boys uh, almost all three of these marine units have the same stats except uh, for their uh, legionary classici I mean uh, what do you call it uh, not the legionary classici the Roman legionary marines uh, is what I was trying to say I mean, they're all Roman Legionary Marines, but this particular unit... Uh, oh, that's it. The Assault Quadrim. Sorry, I was reading the wrong thing. The Assault Quadrim has slightly better stats, uh, but it's not by much. Um, their ship health is also all relatively similar, only being like 100 difference between the um, 60 and 80 man contingent, and then you got to 800 total for your Roman Legionary Marines. So these... All three of these ships basically have Roman Marian legionnaires on them, or legionaries on them. Uh, so they're quite blue, as you can see here. These are like professionally trained marines, entirely spent just for the navy, or recruited just for navy operations. Um, so they're going to be very useful, and let's uh, try to compare the sets to the Principes. The Principes have less armor. But better attack and uh, better defense as well. But these guys have slightly more armor. So very similar overall, really. Um, we're not seeing any scorpions, though, except for this one, which has a scorpion at the front and back. So, again, once you get to 120 men on that ship, you are going to have some scorpions there to help out your little uh, naval contingent. Great unit overall. Well, great units, but I mean. You may as well just use the Principe units if you like. However, we then get to some really, really nice Marines. Uh, these are your still Marian, but you know, entering in Peru ever uh, legionary units. This is your legionary cl uh, veteran unit, basically. Um, these bad boys, they only come on two ships. Uh, one that has 1600 health and the other that has 1200. The 1600 one has this hectic ballista right here, which is pretty insane. Uh, and then you have a tower that will shoot flaming arrows in the rear. And then your 140 man one has the two scorpions, but no tower, unfortunately. Um, but I mean, it has veteran marines. Very, very nice looking. Again, very, very blue, but extremely well equipped and well trained. Uh, they're just very elite. But kind of unnecessary in my opinion. The, the main attraction to these two ships is their ship health in my opinion. Uh, I would try to use them for ramming initially at least. Try to ram the really small ships of the enemy and then board with these very good units against like the admiral of the enemy fleet. Uh, but that's just my recommendation. But that's it for your naval marines that you have. We then have four uh, sets of skirmishes over orders. here. Although we Super do have the two specialist units straight. to talk about in a second. Uh, this, Support ships, these two right here, on. this is the initial early tier levy skirmisher that you get access to, like, instantly. Um, no scorpion, unfortunately. None at the back here, right? Nah. So, very, very low tier, and it's just a javelin. I really don't recommend using javelins in a naval, uh, battle group, unless you're planning something very specific with them, like using them in an amphibious assault. Or maybe you're going to want to gang up on certain, uh, like, transport units. They can actually be quite good at chasing down enemy transports and ramming them, getting you some very nice free kills. But I wouldn't get too many of these in your Roman navies, at least. 
Supply However, ships ready. you do have a more Marian version. Uh, this is your Roman Auxiliary Marines. These guys can actually do pretty well fighting in melee combat. And they have a javelin. Uh, or javelins, I should say. So these guys, if you're wanting to do skirmishes at all, do these guys when you unlock them uh, via reforms. Um, the ship health still isn't very good. Uh, the biggest one floating at 550, so you don't want them to take any hits. But if you get them in boarding actions, they'll do okay. Uh, and again, if you have specific needs for javelins in your naval uh, battle groups, very, very useful in that regard. But as an overall sort of standard, I wouldn't recruit many of these skirmishers. If you want skirmishing potential in your navy, uh, hire mercenaries or some men, because yeah, these guys are not very good. Uh, but anyway, we then get to your two specialist units, your fire pot ships. The fire pots, I still have very mixed feelings about. I've tried to use them effectively in my campaigns, and I just don't think they're as good as they are in vanilla, at least. Um, but, you know, that's just my opinion. Uh, I mean, they have marines on them as well, but it is just a 60 man marine unit. No scorpion, no tower to shoot arrows. Um, your fire pot basically explodes on the enemy ship when you ram it into them, and then it does a big chunk of fire damage. So it can be useful, but you only have a 60-man regiment on this one unit. Uh, and the same Ships for the other waiting. unit, actually. The only difference being the unit that is on it. This is where you have your actual legionary units, uh, your Marion-trained ones. So, you know, the armor is quite good and all of that, but... I mean, is the fire pot really worth that sort of money? Or would you rather spend money on getting, you know, more Principe ship of the lion style ships uh, with a squadron. Uh, I would personally prefer that, but I mean fire pots can be fun. Something different. Uh, but that is that. That is it for your naval sort of potential as Rome. Very nice navy overall. Uh, I know it sort of seems limited based on what I've said, but you are very focused on melee engagements because you're Rome. You absolutely thrive in melee hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, and so, basically, in real life, the Romans made naval engagements into land engagements by forcing the enemy to be boarded. And that was through their uh, large claw thing, what was it called? Oh man, I can't remember. But basically, the Romans always tried to board the enemy ships rather than worrying about like sailing around them, doing some fancy, uh, you know, tactics and whatever. Outmaneuvering the enemy, hitting them with bows and arrows, ramming them, whatever. Nah, -uh. the Romans don't care about that. They just want to get in there and cut their throats. And that's what you need to do if you want to utilize the Roman Navy to its best potential. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, let's now go ahead and jump into the second part of this part two section. Uh, and we will finally talk about the land units of the Roman Republic. Alrighty, everybody. Here we are with the land military of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire all squashed into one. <laughs> uh, this is going to be quite a large section here. Um, however, before we do jump into going over all of the units that we can, um, I will just state that for the purpose of doing just a faction overview of Rome itself, we will not and honestly we cannot cover the, all of the auxiliary units that are in the roster for Rome. Uh, Rome gets access to hundreds of auxiliary units that span almost across the entire map uh, by a few provinces and it's literally impossible to get them all into a custom battle let alone uh, analyze all of them statistically. So in the future I do hope to do videos highlighting the auxiliary units but as you can see here uh, all of the units I have selected are what belong to the core Roman roster. So that means all of these units that I'm displaying, you can basically recruit as many of them as you like and you can uh, recruit them pretty much anywhere in your empire uh, because they belong to the core Roman roster. In saying that, however, one thing I have done for this faction overview to make it very easy for you all to watch and figure out what's what, is instead of listing the units based on the type of units, such as all of the skirmishes in one area and then all of the cavalry in another, 
I have actually gone to the effort of separating them all into the different reform eras. So you can see we have multiple lines here. Um, we actually uh, have, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, six different lines. There is not six reforms for the Romans. Uh, I will explain each line and whatever. But uh, I will actually, for this purpose, for, I mean for this section of the video, I will add timestamps. So if you want to see the core, like, Camillan roster units, uh, or the Camillan reform area units, check that down below. If you want to see the Marian specific core units, check the uh, description or just hover over the video, depending on your device that you're watching this on, and you'll be able to just jump back and forth quite easily. But anyway, now that we've got that out of the way, let's jump into checking out the units of Rome. So before we jump into the Camillan reform era, I want to go over some of the generals that we do have for Rome. Over here we have three different units that I've selected out of like the six or seven different potential ones. There's a lot of different generals you can get for Rome. But I thought this would showcase um, the typical sort of progression system of Rome for your generals. Uh, and I also tried to get the ones that, uh, in my opinion, the most interesting. Um, here is Sons the three units that we're going to be looking at, so you can look at the unit cards down here if you like. But because we have so many men, I actually am going to go ahead and hide the uh, unit card symbols, just because we have way too much on the screen right now. And I like to actually keep the map open, so we can use our little map tools like that. And that's how I do that, FYI guys, I don't do that in post-editing, but anyway. Uh, the first unit we're going to check out is the Camillan General's Bodyguard. Obviously this unit is available during the Camillan Reforms era. And this is the very first General's Bodyguard that you'll be using when you play as Rome. Uh, very useful bodyguard unit. And the main reason for that is that Rome lacks cavalry pretty severely, especially in the early game. So this will be one of the units you'll be able to use to outflank the enemy units, try to get the skirmishers or lighter units. Um, it's a pretty, I wouldn't say very heavy, but it's a heavy melee cav unit. It can still do, uh, can still do some good damage on the charge, but it's going to shine when it's against either lightly armored cavalry or light infantry. Um, but, I mean, it can still hold itself up in a fight for a while against other heavier cav units. But, that's going to be a unit that you use for a very long time, and it's a unit that everyone has to use as Rome, unless you prefer to try and do, like, the infantry uh, equivalent. Such as using the uh, Praetorians when you get access to them, but anyway. Legatus! After you have the Marian reform, so this is quite a jump, we're skipping the Polybian era just because the Polybian general bodyguard is very similar to the Camillan, just better stats for the most part. Uh, we then get to the general of the legion, now this is going to be one of your really common general's bodyguards again. Uh, this is where it, during the Marian era we have a lot of uniformity coming in, coming into the Roman military. And these guys demonstrate it quite vividly with the same shields, armor, at least similar armor. Uh, just very standardized, but also very like professional looking. This is, you know, the cream and butter, as it were, of the Roman army as most people seem to know it. Uh, I'm not going to go over the stats, but again, relatively heavy melee cav units, similar to the Camillan. Um, and the stats are actually very, very similar. Uh, with the Camillan actually having better armor overall. Uh, but anyway, just wanted to showcase that unit to you all. General. But then we're going to jump up to the very dramatic looking Imperial Praetorian bodyguards. Um, these guys are on, not, well not on horseback, they're on their own feet, as you can see, little toesies. Um, you can get a cavalry version, and in fact we'll see some Praetorian cavalry soon. That isn't a bodyguard, but I did just want to show you guys the infantry variant. Very, very God. tough infantry unit. Uh, very good for like being used in a governor position or something like that. Um, and it does have quite a lot of abilities down here in the bottom left corner. You can see a lot's going on. You do have the Testudo ability, defensive formation, and the hollow square. Uh, you got a lot going on here. Uh, so yeah. Very, very useful infantry unit. I would recommend you use infantry units for like your governor sort of generals, um, especially for administrative roles. 
because they're cheaper, but it's still quite useful in like defending a city, for example. Uh, it would take a lot to kill a unit like this Praetorian Bodyguard, but I also just wanted to show off that unit too. It's not a unit that everyone who plays Rome actually gets to use because you don't get into the Imperial Era until after turn 200, so uh, I believe it's 210 is what I said earlier, right? So it takes a long time to get them, but anyway, that is the three generals I just wanted to highlight. You have a lot more that you can choose from, and they change based on your Reform Era. But now let's jump into the Camillan reforms for Rome. That is going to be this line right here. You can see we do have a decent line going up and down here. Uh, relatively decent in terms of, uh, of uh, diversity, at least considering that you're playing as Rome. Um, but let's get our unit cards up again. This is going to be group 2 that I have selected down here at the bottom. You can see them again highlighted with the gold. Uh, we're going to start on the far left hand side where we have our Rorari. Ror Rorari? Ror I can never pronounce this right. If someone could tell me how the bloody hell you're supposed to pronounce this. Uh, Ror Rorari. Rorari, I believe is how you say it. Um, very low tier militia unit. Doesn't even have a javelin, but I mean, it's okay for trying to protect a flank or basically be a decent meat shield because it has quite high defense. But it's armor 8 means that it will die still pretty quickly. Uh, so don't rely on it for anything. But then we get to the cream and butter. We get to the Hastadi, at least in the first variant that you get access to. Uh, the Hastadi is definitely a staple of the Roman Legion, especially of the Roman Republican era. Uh, these guys are very, very nice to have. However, they do come from the pleb social class which in my opinion means that they aren't worth buying and what I would instead recommend you do please keep in mind too that these Sestari only have spears uh, I would recommend instead go for the uh, Principes which we'll see here in a second um, I do want to show you guys a Samnite variant as well uh, all of your uh, Camillan and Polybian units such as Sestari and Principes do have a Samnite equivalent. And you will see other units that are similar that are AOR units and uh, auxiliaries that you can get access to, but the Samnites and basically a unit that isn't like a quote-unquote purebred Roman unit is going to be slightly less in statistics in most areas. Not every single time, um, but basically the uh, reason behind that is that they aren't Roman, they don't have the complete training that the Roman soldiers would. Um, these guys are Samnites. They've been given some Roman training and they've given some Roman standardized equipment, but they're also expected to bring their own stuff. Um, so that's why the stats are slightly different. Not a big deal. Um, 15 armor for the Samnite version of the Hestati versus 20 for the standard Hestati is the biggest difference in my opinion. Um, and then there's a melee difference of one. So, not too much of a big deal. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Um, although it is worth pointing out, both uh, units do have access to the defensive formation and the repeller equites or repel cavalry formation as well. Both very helpful. Uh, formations can really, really give you the edge that you need in uh, battles, whether it's online or against AI. We then jump up to the Principes. This is a Samnite variant of the Principes, again still just using spears, but your armor jumps up massively to 30 armor, and that's for the Samnite equivalent. Um, for your standard Principe unit, it goes up to 35. So, Principes! I mean, man, that armor is pretty delicious for such an early game unit. Turn 1, you can recruit these guys. You don't need reforms or anything special, just need a barracks to let you recruit in the city. Uh, so I would really, really recommend get Principes to be the core of your legions. That's what I do in my Roman campaigns. Um, I always try to bring around six to eight of them as a core line. Uh, Hestadi can be good as like a secondary sort of position. And they are slightly faster as well, so having them in reserve can be really good. But if you want to do the role play of the Roman legions and have like a triplex axes formation, with Hestadi in front of these bad boys, and Hestadi will get wrecked, but the Principes will come in 
and do some heavy damage and that will have a lot of their men left standing unless they get you know really hammered surrounded etc uh, and all the typical things you need to do to take down a heavy unit um, it is worth noting because they have the spear and whatnot they have a really big bonus against cavalry of 17 so if you're facing against cav heavy nations such as Carthage get these guys involved in the killing of the cav and it will go very well for them again both uh, units have defensive formation and the repel cavalry formation continuing the trend of the spears though we have hoplites uh, this is your Petites Extraordinarii the early equivalent uh, they have the phalanx ability because this is basically a hoplite. Uh, the Romans, during their early stage of warfare, based their fighting style off the Greeks, for the most part, and other Italians. Uh, and as such, this unit reflects that quite well. It's basically like a Triaria unit, except this is an allied version. And then over here, we actually have your core Triaria unit, which has almost the exact same stance, except Triari! your Roman Triaria unit has 50 base morale uh, instead of 49, so very minor difference. Uh, the visuals are quite different though. You can see there's still like some very heavy Greek uh, influence in the shields and whatnot, but then you also see the Roman style shields coming out, or Italian, however you want to say it. Uh, so very, very nice unit, but only 200 men per uh, units and again both units here only have the phalanx ability Then we get to the cavalry available to you during the Camillan era equites! We have typical equites, which is Camillan cavalry uh, Melee cavalry, which is the majority of Roman cav really Overall decent cavalry unit, but it can get outclassed very very quickly So be careful of the cav that you send this against However, we then also have another unit Saki! which is your Equites Extraordinarii, basically your uh, Italian allies that are Equites. Uh, they are better than your standard Equites in many, many ways. Uh, and in fact, they're a very, very good cav unit overall. It's almost like if you put your Triarii uh, allied units and put them on horseback, uh, to be honest. Uh, very heavy armor at 41, which is fantastic for the early game. Melee defense, 13. Attack of 9. Charge bonus of 48. These guys are tanks. Very, very helpful early on, but also very expensive. And they do come from the highest tier of your social class, so uh, can be a bit of a pain trying to maintain that population. But anyway, uh, if you don't have AOR or, or auxiliary units available, which you do, uh, I mean, let's be honest, uh, everyone knows you can get like the Sam Knight mercenary units in Italy. Um, but if you don't, for whatever reason, want to use those units, these guys are fantastic. Very, very helpful. Then, one of the few occasions where we have some purebred Roman skirmishers, these are Camillan Levy Slingers, really terrible. I wouldn't recommend using them all that much, uh, and if you do, you're probably going to delete them after, you know, a couple dozen turns or so anyway, once you defeat, like, the Elephants of Pyrus, uh, or whatever, um, Pyrus. Not very useful, really, really low tier, just overall terrible. Levy! You then have a levy unit, which is your Camilla Levy Javelinman. Uh, these guys, in my opinion, are more useful, and I tend to recruit more of these than the skirmishers, uh, the slingers. Uh, but again, I mean, the stats are horrendous. But a javelin can do a lot more damage than a sling in a faster time period, so just keep that in mind. But that's it. Only two sets of cavalry, besides your general, FYI. Uh, and then two sets of skirmishers, and then you have all of these spearmen, zero swordsmen, zero axemen for your core roster in that first reform period. However, as we move along over here, we get to what is known as the Polybian reforms. Uh, so this is going to be our number three right here. You can see I'm highlighting those unit cards. So if you like, you can pause the screen, pause the video, I mean, look at the screen, check out those unit cards. Uh, but again, I want to try to get some space so you guys can actually see the units. Um, amazing unit cards. I'm very, very impressed. I love them. Uh, but I'm trying to keep, you know, less crap on the screen, basically. Alright. More uh, Warari here. Um, 
They still only have 10 armor, unfortunately, so again, it's not really worth recruiting them unless you desperately need some really low tier spearmen to help sort of garrison a city or whatever. Uh, but yeah, d don't really recommend getting them. Instead, get yourself some well trained Hastati. Uh, and this is the Samnite version yet again. So we're going to see that trend where we have the Samnite version, uh, which is basically like your Italian ally. Although it's called the Samnite uh, version. Uh, you do have javelins here as well, FYI. Uh, as you did before in the Chameleon era, but that's something I sort of glanced over. However, this is also where we are st now starting to use swords instead of spears. Uh, so your Hestati are going to be a lot more useful in this period rather than the last one, in my opinion. Uh, and that goes for your Sunlight version and for the Hestati. typical Roman version, which is right here. They look great and I mean, I just wish that the Hestati didn't die so quickly. Uh, they're a bit better here compared to the Camillan period, so if you're going to use the study, I would recommend you do it during the Polybian Reforms era. Uh, but yeah, just overall fantastic. But the main key to know is that their armor penetration is quite low. So, for example, against head-to-head -head against hoplites, they're not going to do too well. But they're very maneuverable and they do have formation abilities. Hollow Square, Defensive Formation, and Testudo. Which is very powerful. Very helpful, very versatile units, which is the entire Roman army summed up in a few words. Is versatile, disciplined, um, and I, I guess adapting, but that would go into versatile. Just yeah, they're disciplined, but they're still very, very versatile. Uh, if you start attacking an enemy head on that you don't want to attack, your unit can easily retreat or go into a defensive formation while an ally comes around and hits the enemy in the flank. Use your formation ab abilities, it really does help, guys. Principes. We then jump up to the Principe Samnite units, your Principe Italian allies. Um, comparing it to like your Hastati, uh, again, it's quite a strong difference. Um, not as massive as it is in the Camillan era, um, but. I would still really favor getting Principes over the Hastati. Um, that high armor is just so good, it's almost impossible to ignore. Especially if you can get the purebred Roman uh, Polybian units. I mean, a uh, Principe unit. Uh, that armor of 35 is just gross. It's really, really powerful. Melee defense of 15, yet this is also a sword unit, so you have a melee attack of 11. Uh, weapon damage total of 30, not bad at all. Just fantastic. Again, has the defensive formation, Hollow Square Testudo. Absolutely amazing unit. One of the best units you'll be able to use in the early game because it's so cost effective. You will get hundreds of kills with like a single cohort of these guys as long as you get them into. A standard situation it doesn't even have to be favorable to them it just needs to be standard get them into one-on-ones with most enemy units they will come out on top unless it's against like an elite unit or a pike unit hoplites will give them a run for their money but your principes should still win uh, depending on the enemy hoplite At your service. however speaking of hoplites we still do have some spearmen although they're not hoplites anymore these guys are basically like elite principes from the Camillan era, uh, even though they're our allied triarii. Uh, very, very heavy, very solid on defense, same formations as the previous units we just discussed, big uh, shields, decent sized spears, um, but now this is getting to the era where spears are starting to become more and more redundant, especially because they're so heavy. Um, so like the price for a single one of these, you might just want to get two principal units instead. You know, uh, your Principes can still do excellent against Cavalry. These guys will decimate Cavalry, but the AI knows that and they will try to retreat and get away from your Spearmen, as will most players, you know. Um, they can still be very useful, but I wouldn't recruit them in every single army that I made, and even the ones I do, I would probably just do only a couple units. We await your command. Even the same thing for the Roman Triarii version, but... Uh, again, trying to get you guys at least a few little close-ups here. This is a unit that I'm sure many of you have seen, if not all of you. 
but it's just so strong. That armor combined with that really high melee defense is what is going to make your unit last a super long time. Uh, and it just works. It just works. Man of Italia! However, we have a few units of cavalry actually here. Let's bump these guys forward a little. Here we have your socii equites, your Italian uh, equite units again. Uh, this time they aren't the best unit that you have straight away. Uh, but they're still quite good. Just overall pretty standard uh, heavy uh, melee cavalry unit. Still has a very decent charge bonus at 47, so you can still use it as a shock cav. Uh, Jupiter gives us strength. We then have like a standard equite version over here. This is more of your Roman style unit. Um, I mean, very similar in stats. The only difference being base morale. So, doesn't really matter which one you pick. In reality, it's up to you. Um, just be. Aware that there isn't too much of a difference, uh, so don't really prioritize one over the other. However, Sucky! we do get to another Sakiya unit, which is your Equites Extraordinary late version. This is that really heavy cab unit we just talked about earlier, except it's available during the Polybian era as well. Fantastic unit again. Um, I mean, its its attack could be slightly higher, but its defense and armor is so strong. That it's going to have all the time in the world to decimate whatever unit it's engaged against. Um, again, the visuals absolutely gobsmacking. Really, really impressive. Very immersive, in my opinion. Love these types of Italian uh, units. But again, it's a Roman core unit. It is not an auxiliary, so you can recruit as many as you like, really. As many as you can afford, at least. Relites! And then this is the only skirmish that you get access to that is unlocked at least during the Polybian era. Uh, your Velites. Now these guys are actually very helpful. You'll be using them throughout this era of your Polybian era. Uh, and then you can recruit them into the next tier skirmisher which we'll talk about shortly but uh, yeah just great unit overall. Just a javelin unit. Um, it's melee attack is okay at 9. Defense is eh, okay at 10. But its armor is only at 8, so I wouldn't really use this for melee engagements except to chase away enemy skirmishers. Uh, or maybe to sort of harass enemy cavalry, maybe you can mix them in with your own cav, throw the javelins and then see what they can do against enemy cav. But don't expect a lot of kills in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but they will at least last a couple minutes before they get destroyed. But that is your Polybian Era of Reforms. A little bit more cavalry, uh, but the major change during this era is that spears are going out of fashion and that the Romans are now starting to favor the sword. And you are also starting to get a lot more organized, so that means that your units are in tighter formations, as you can see. Uh, you can also see that they're getting access to more abilities, such as Testudo, Defensive Formation, Hollow Square. All of these are very useful formations for you to use. Uh, I highly recommend you practice with those, experiment a little, see what helps, what doesn't help as much. Uh, and be aware that the sword is really, really powerful. Uh, and it makes such a big difference upgrading from the Camillian era units to the Polybian. However, we then have another era of reforms. You can see it's not as many units available here, but it's still quite helpful. Uh, this is your Marian Era of Reform. So let's open up our unit cards. This is going to be number four, right? Yep. So not too many over here now. Uh, and the main emphasis during the Marian Reforms is getting access to the standardized Roman legionary. The typical sort of legionaries that we hear about that marched with Caesar. That marched with Pompey Magnus. Uh, that marched with those titans of Roman society. Um... These are not the Imperial Legionnaires that march with, say, uh, Octavian or Trajan, but, you know, this is where Rome is absolutely in its golden age of military warfare and conquest. Um, Legionaries! We can see right here, this is your Marian Volunteer Legionary unit, and it's, it's just a volunteer unit, but it's still really great. Um, you still have access to all of the same abilities we just discussed. Uh, defense and attack is okay, and this is your legionnaire, basically militia variant. So, 
fantastic unit considering it's just that. Uh, very good at being able to be recruited quickly and like defend towns or uh, garrison like low uh, low uh, low strategic areas or areas that are not really of strategic importance but you still want to have at least a few units in your army. Um, they could also be good to plug in holes in the line or perhaps even act as like a bit of a screen for your units that we're about to discuss which is of course the absolute Romans, iconic unit that is associated with Rome is the Marian Legionaries. This is where the Legionary is born in its truest sense for Rome. Uh, this is where we also see very standardized equipment, so their armor is all at a flat 38. Her attack is 11, defense of 15, so fantastic stats still, yet again. Uh, you have the Testudo, defensive formation, hollow square as well. Your weapon damage total goes up to 30. Um, your charge isn't too amazing, it's only 18, so the charge isn't necessarily going to make a massive difference. Um, but really, the big thing here is standardization of equipment and discipline. So really, uh, the biggest Merry thing troops. that you need to know is the difference in like positioning. For example, the formation is extremely tight right here, whereas compared to your other units, it's slightly more spaced out uh, in the uh, Polybian era. But during the Marian era, this is where things are getting serious. You now have an actual military not just a Republican militia that is somewhat professional. These guys are the definition of professional soldiers in the ancient world. Uh, they are paid to fight. They are loyal to their general, at least to the general that grants some victories. And they will allow you to convert your Republic into an empire eventually, if you so wish. Uh, but anyway, fantastic unit. Your orders. We then have the Cohorts Prima, aka the Marian First Cohort. Uh, this has 400 men in it, but don't be fooled, your 400 men still sort of mean that uh, this unit isn't going to be extremely powerful. You're not going to fill up your army with just this unit in particular. If you do, you're a fool. I would not recommend it. And in fact, you're actually probably noticed that these units that have 400 men die faster than the units that have 200 men. And that's simply because you have more men to lose, really. Uh, your HP isn't really all that much more than the standard unit, so your men, while they're all still very great and effective and everything, you will actually lose them quite quickly, especially to enemy skirmishes. Uh, at least relatively quickly considering the type of unit this is. Um, the main thing that the first cohort gives is encouragement. Uh, nearby units are boosted in terms of their morale when they are close to this uh, within its radius so it's good to have one of these in your army maybe keep it in your second line in the center of your army to try and uh, inspire as many men as you can uh, or you can let it fight on the front line the golden the golden eagle definitely can get things done uh, but just don't be uh, overconfident because it just has 400 men uh, you know it's just something to point out statistically too there isn't much of a difference between this and your Marian legionaries. Uh, just base morale, really. But the encouragement buff is very, very helpful. So I would definitely recommend at least one of these in each of your standard legions. Melee infantry ready. However, then we jump up to your Marian veteran legionaries. These guys are very, very strong. Uh, a little bit more aggressive than your standard legionary with a melee attack of 13, defense of 16. Uh, charge bonus is higher as well as is the weapon damage. Everything is just a little bit higher, although their armor is at 38. Um, so again, that standardization of equipment is still there, but these guys have seen some things. You know, they've been there and done that. They are extremely skilled. Uh, you really want to have a good handful of them in most of your legions, just to basically fall back on in times of desperation. These guys. Are what the Triarii become basically. They're the elites of your army. Rely on them in a way that you would most elites for other factions. So fantastic unit of Rolo. Jupiter gives us strength. We then also have Marian Legionary Cavalry that comes into play right here. Uh, still relatively similar to the last few melee cav units that we've looked at, except they're upgraded in equipment. Still got that armor 41. 
Uh, overall, very helpful, but still will be outclassed by like high tier units uh, of cavalry from other factions such as Carthage. So again, just be very aware of what you let them charge into. No ammunition, so no javelin to throw, FYI. This is a melee cav unit. Missile infantry ready. Now, this is sadly the last skirmish we get to talk about for the Romans, the Marian Legionary Javelin Wing Unit. Uh, basically, the Velites get upgraded into a very standardized version. These guys are very, very useful. Armor 25, which is very good for a skirmisher. Uh, they still have um, their ammunition of 6 that so I can get in. Quite a few javelins get some damage in. Range of 90, which is pretty good. Uh, missile damage is high at 22. And their attack and defense combined with their armor means that they'll actually be able to continue melee fighting relatively okay. Considering that they are a skirmisher unit. So I would recommend get them involved in... The melee fighting after they've expended all their javelins. Just be wary of what you're engaging them against. Obviously, you don't want to take you on the main line of the enemy, but maybe they could try and take out the enemy skirmishers uh, or help out against the enemy cavalry. And that's really going to be a big uh, help for your men. But anyway, that's your Marian era of reforms right there. Relatively small, but also extremely important. It's also worth pointing out too. During the Marian reforms era, the biggest thing that you get that is really going to help you in your campaign, at least, is that your legionary units now come from your third tier of your social class, which is your proletarii. These are basically the poor peasants of Roman society who are now being paid to become professional fighters. Uh, so you will have tens of thousands of men in single cities on their own that you can recruit into the standardized form of play and this is really the main reason that Rome is so powerful in the main campaign you can pump out these fantastic very cost-effective soldiers in you know the tens of thousands if not more depending on how many cities you have it's absolutely astronomical the potential with them and that's why Rome was so good in real life and that's the big advantage that Rome has in the campaign uh, so, to those of you who wonder why the Roman military in DEI is praised so highly, it's because of this era of reforms. You get some amazing units, and you have them by the tens of thousands. Very, I wouldn't say very early on, but it doesn't take long to get to that era. Okay, everyone, here we are at our last reform era, the Imperial Reform Era. That's right, this is where you're no longer known as the Roman Republic. But the Roman Empire, the era which everyone dreams to achieve when they do a Roman playthrough, let's be honest. We all want to make the Roman Empire when we're playing as Rome. Um, and these are the bad boys that will get it done for you. Uh, they are highlighted down here in the unit cards again, if you want to have a quick look. Feel free. Again, unit cards are on point as they are for all of the units in my opinion. Uh, but let's get to look. And what brings you this empire? What allows you to expand your empire across the map and paint everything red with the color of Rome? These are your imperial legionaries. Uh, so these are very similar to the Marian legionaries. Uh, the main difference being that their armor has gotten better. Basically, you can even see, not the toes, but the L, uh, around the chest here. Uh, their armor is just getting way more on point, their helmets are far more protective, and so your standard main body line, main front line unit you have access to has an armor of 41, which is just disgusting. Very, very high indeed, uh, and it just gets better and better from there, so that is your Marian Legionary unit. I, I guess this is the unit that a lot of people would think of as well when they say Roman Empire, but... I mean, to be fair, they are very similar to the Marian Legionary units. Um, just incredible to see. Proud Romans all. Now, after that, we then get to the Evocata Germanica, basically the Imperial Veteran Legionaries. However, something that's happened in the 1.3.2 update is that there's been changes done to these elite Imperial units of Rome, just to try and diversify them a little bit. So, for example, these Germanic veteran units, or the veteran unit, I guess, uh, actually 
has very good stats and they're a lot more aggressive because these bad boys have been fighting the Germans. The Germans are renowned for being excellent fighters and because these guys are veterans of those campaigns they now actually have bonuses that other Roman legionary units don't have. Uh, specifically they have a now uh, have a bonus against infantry. They have a bonus versus infantry of 3. Um, and then melee attack is at 12 which helps. Defense 16. Armor is slightly lower at 38 compared to your base legionary. Um, but that Bonus versus infantry um, can really help you out, especially against elite units. It might give you a slight edge. Uh, it's not a massive difference, but it is enough to be worth mentioning, in my opinion. Again, we're seeing the same hollow square defensive formation in Testudo. Um, no cavalry repel technique, but you use the um, defensive formation for that typically. It depends on what, on all the hollow square. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to note that that's how the DEI devs have tried to alter the basically Imperial elite units that you could access to. So the Germanic unit, basically an overview of that is saying that it's better against enemy infantry. Melee troops awaiting orders. We then have an Imperial uh, Eagle Cohort unit right here. Very similar to your last Imperial Cohort, except this looks way more on point. Oh my gosh, they look insane. Uh, again, very, very useful due to that Encourage ability. Highly recommend you get at least one of these in each of your Imperial Legions. When you get access to them, base morale of 60. That's redonkulous. Attack of 13, defense of 16. Uh, I would definitely get at least one of them in each of your uh, Legions when you can. Jupiter gives us strength! We then get the Kohor's Evocata. Uh, now these guys are again Imperial Veteran Legionaries. However, these guys are different to the Germanic uh, Veteran Legionary unit because they have a bonus against Elephants. Bonus against Elephants of 4. Uh, they still do have a bonus versus infantry of 1. They are Veterans, they know how to kill. Uh, so they're going to have slightly higher stats than most other units. And they do have the armor of 41, whereas the German uh, Germanica cohort unit we just checked out only at 38. Um, so quite helpful overall for that. Uh, these guys are probably going to be better on your campaigns against the Eastern factions or the African factions, but a relatively minor difference, but it can still go a long way in my opinion. Um, and it's just regardless a fantastic unit with incredible stats. Uh, there really isn't really any reason you would not want to recruit that unit. Legionaries! Then we get to the chonky boys of the Roma Legions. <laughs> oh my gosh, these guys are insane. When you can recruit an entire legion of just these guys, that's when you know you've won the game as Rome. Uh, the Imperial Cataphract Legionaries. Um, they don't have that bonus against elephants or any cavalry. But one just bonus against an infantry of literally just one. Their melee attack is only at 11, but their armor is at 46. These guys really are cataphract legionaries. Um, they're basically uh, Parthian cataphracts on foot, except these guys are better at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Again, we still have that javelin, still have those same abilities, Testudo, Hollow Square Defensive Formation. Uh, only 200 men here, but I mean it's a fantastic unit to have. Very useful against skirmisher heavy factions as well. So you would probably want to use it against the eastern factions and things like that. Uh, but that is all of our infantry that we have to discuss. Legionary cavalry! We do have some imperial cavalry that gets involved in this era. Literally the Equites Leg Legionis, the imperial legionary cavalry. Um, Fantastic standard of cavalry that you get access to. Again, the biggest difference being armor and just overall equipment. And you can see it just by looking at the units. You can see that the helmets are better. You can see that their chainmail is going quite well. Um, still have that large shield, so it means that they have a really nice melee defense. Armor is at 41. Overall, just a great unit to have. Then we have the Imperial Praetorian Cavalry. Praetorian Cavalry. Right here, look at look at that shield. Oh my gosh, that looks insane, mate. Absolutely stunning textures for these guys. See some interesting generals here. 
He almost, he's almost got a bit of a Gallic look going on right here. Uh, which would be fitting though, because this is the Empire period. This is where Rome is starting to rely more and more on outsiders, people from outside Italy. And apparently also including twins, but anyway, <clears throat> moving on. Uh, now this is just a fantastic unit, and you can recruit this as a general, so why wouldn't you recruit it really, besides the really large cost that comes with it, but by the time you can recruit this into your armies, cost really isn't going to matter all that much, it's just going to be up to what you want to use. Um, you do have the flying wedge formation as well as the cavalry testudo. Equites! Same thing for the Imperial Legionary Cavalry, and I believe the Marion Cav. Legionary yeah, cavalry! I just forgot to point that out earlier. Um, and then your Polybian Cavalry Equites! just has the wedge formation. Uh, whereas I believe the Camillans don't even have that, do they? Oh no, they do. So you can get wedge formation for all of your units, but then Marion onwards is where you get the Cavalry Testudo. Uh, so that's just worth pointing out. Um, but anyway... That is all of your reforms that we've gone through. Imperial, Marian, Polybian, and then your starting reform, which is the Camillan. Um, they all have their own advantages and disadvantages, but really, the longer Rome survives in the campaign, the better it gets overall. Uh, it's just a bit of a no-brainer. And this isn't even taking into account the auxiliary units and the mercenaries and the countless AOR units you get access to, literally over a couple thousand of them. Uh, several thousand from what I've been told, so there's so many units in this mod that you get access to. And this is just like your base template for a Roman legion for each of these different reform errors. Um, so don't stress out, I know it might seem like you're really missing out heavily on cavalry and skirmishes, but you can make up for that literally on turn one quite easily so it's not a big deal but I just wanted to again focus showing you the Roman core roster however we do have two more units to talk about these bad boys right here these are some special units that Rome gets access to Animal handlers ready. access to some war dogs I don't really like to use these to be honest it's fun to try and experiment get these little pit bulls is that a pit bull I think it's pit bull uh, these dogs involved in the fighting is just, you know, interesting. Um, when you do use them, I recommend using it against either light infantry or skirmishers or horsemen. Uh, cavalry is the main thing you'll want to use them with. They scare the crap out of horses and they actually can be quite deadly. Um, so you do get access to war dogs pretty early on. And then you do get access to pretty much all of the forms of siege equipment that are available. However, you are the only faction that gets the Stone Thrower, aka the Oniger. Uh, Oniger, however you want to say it. Uh, quite a useful unit, very high missile damage, very long range as well at 365. Uh, so it's, again, a bit of a no brainer if you need siege equipment. Like, look how far that is. Out here is how far away that can shoot. Like, that's pretty insane. Um, and it's going to be quite useful against enemy infantry formations and siege equipment. Um, I mean, uh, and like uh, cities and whatnot. These guys are from the Marian era, as you, can oh, as you can see with their armor. You have your standard round for shooting them, you have your flammable round, and then you have your poison round as well. All of them have their own uh, benefits and uh, debuffs against them as well. So it's up to you what you want to use in the right time. That's probably another video to be talked about later on. Um, but I just wanted to point out that Rome also has some unique units that you could access to uh, to talk about. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for the military of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. Uh, now we will move on to the verdict and then we will end things there. Alrighty everybody, here we come to the verdict, finally. I know it's been a very, very long video, which is ironic because our verdict is actually going to be quite short. I don't have all that many points to talk about when it comes to Rome at the end of this video, at least. I've kind of given you all the information that I have, um, at least the majority of it. I don't want to spoil every single little thing for you guys, and I don't want to list every single tiny statistic that makes Rome the juggernaut that it is in the Rome DEI campaign at least um, and before I give this difficulty rating please do keep in mind 
that I tailor these faction overviews to the average DEI player. That's someone who, in my opinion, has a basic understanding of the game mechanics and has one to two hundred hours of DEI gameplay under the belt. Um, so again, just the average DEI player, not terrible and not super extreme and competitive. Uh, so obviously, depending who you are on that sort of scale of things is going to determine your own difficulty level for, for the faction. Uh, and another thing I take into consideration is that this faction overview is primarily tailored to the Grand Campaign, although it's still relevant pretty much across all campaigns, uh, but it's tailored to the Grand Campaign experience on a normal campaign difficulty setting. I recommend you start at normal campaigns, and if you find that too easy, then bump it up to hard. Hard is usually where you'll have the most uh, fun experience where the difficulty rating isn't too ridiculous, it doesn't feel unfair, but you have aggressive AI all around you. On normal campaign difficulty, you still get the AI being somewhat aggressive, however it's far more possible or likely that you'll be able to do diplomacy, which is why sometimes I'll still play on normal campaign difficulty and I'll just use sub mods to increase the difficulty. So short version, this is for the average DEI player on a typical normal campaign and battle difficulty setting. Uh, so let's talk about the few points that I have and then we'll talk about the difficulty rating. So really the only thing I could find that was difficult about playing as Rome is that you have to fight on multiple fronts pretty much throughout your entire campaign. Uh, especially in those higher campaign difficulties you'll notice that a lot. Uh, that's the number one thing that I see people complain about is being really difficult about Rome. I mean, you literally start off in two different wars that go in two different directions instantly on turn one. So, in theory, that sounds very, very overwhelming. However, Rome is just too good, man. I mean, as long as you are fighting your battles manually and not allowing the AI to give you a really bad order resolve, you should be winning your battles 90 plus percent of the time it's going to be very rare very rare sorry where you have a battle against an ai faction keep in mind this is just against ai not multiplayer uh and you can't beat it your roaming units even during the camillan era just so good so high in morale and discipline their armor is great it's really i wouldn't say it's hard to lose your battles but if you're losing battles consistently, then I would say the faction isn't necessarily the problem, which, you know, I mean, we all get along, we all gonna start somewhere, we're all not gonna be great, amazing Total War players or whatever, instantly. Um, but Rome is just too good to fail, for the most part, in my opinion. The biggest difficulty you'll have is in the early game where you have to fight in multiple directions, which just requires a bit of common sense to combat. If you want to go ahead and fight Carthage really, really quickly, which I don't recommend, but if you do want to do it, obviously you don't want to continue expanding north into the Gallic territories. Doesn't make sense. You're going to be encountering a lot of people that don't like you. Um, obviously, you're going to have multiple wars coming your way, so you use diplomacy just like the Romans did in real life. A divide and conquer approach. I know it's shocking, but really a lot of a decent amount of common sense can really minimize that negative. Uh, thing that you have to deal with. Besides that, Rome has everything it can have and what it doesn't have instantly, or at least quickly, it will get in time. Rome really does become a juggernaut in pretty much every DEI campaign for a very good reason. It really is just that powerful, borderline unstoppable, and in the hands of an average DEI player, it should still be that juggernaut. You will take some losses here and there, uh, the AI will really try to overwhelm you with multiple armies at once, but again, one of your solid armies should be able to take on two large enemy armies with no problem, really. Yes, you'll suffer casualties, but that's when you start to use the auxiliary and AOR system to soak up uh, the enemy damage, um, which is a whole other video again, but in my opinion, that's really the only negative thing you've got to worry about. Uh, my next point is that your economy is going to blow up really, really quickly. The more you expand, the faster it will blow up. Um, yes, you do need to recruit more legions to defend your territory. However, again, common sense, divide and conquer approach. Use diplomacy to your advantage and then get allies in certain places that will help you protect your flanks or certain vulnerable areas. Um, diplomacy, though, isn't going to be 
a major thing. You're not going to have a lot of intrigue or anything like that, in my opinion. Uh, primarily because you'll be conquering so quickly, and usually the more you conquer, the more people hate you. However, I do recommend you try to get at least one to two really, really dependable, solid allies. Uh, basically, two factions that you think are going to do well in the campaign, and that you try to basically keep them happy, sway to your side of things. So, some really good examples would be, in my opinion, Egypt, uh, possibly the Seleucids, um, any of the Numidian factions, whichever is looking to be the biggest, uh, and Massalia. Uh, basically, you're looking for Hellenic factions that will help you uh, in protecting your east or your southeastern flanks as you conquer out into the Mediterranean. Uh, and the Numidians can be really helpful for dealing with Carthage. Uh, the rest of the factions, I mean, it's up to you and depends what happens in your campaign. But those just would be some really clear cookie cutter examples, in my opinion, of factions that you would almost always want to ally with. Not all of them at once per se, but at least as high ranking candidates. And then, uh, Overall, my last point is that it's an excellent faction for any player of any sort of level or skill set. You do not need to be an elite player to do really, really well consistently in this faction. Uh, so to new people to DEI, I absolutely recommend that you check out playing as Rome. Just be aware that you will have to fight in multiple directions. But again, slow down your gameplay, take your time, and really think about what happens if you take out X, Y, or Z faction. If you take out the Etruscans quickly, that's perfect, but you're now exposed to Gauls that were to the north behind them. So now you've got to think about how you want to deal with them. You see what I mean? It's very common sense based. You don't have to know anything too secretive or detailed to ensure that you do have a good time playing as Rome. In saying that though, I do understand how some players can become overwhelmed uh, with the multiple directions that you end up facing, especially if you get very unlucky and you get like just an insane amount of factions declaring war on you, it can be quite uh, hectic, I guess, is a good way of putting it. But again, normal campaign difficulty, it still really shouldn't be much of a problem. On the hard campaign difficulty, I can definitely see it popping up. But Rome is just so solid, so good, so hard to slow down, really. Um, in my opinion, you should still be doing quite well without any difficulty submods or anything like that so please do keep that in mind because i'm about to give you this difficulty rating which in my personal opinion rome is a three out of ten this is a easy campaign uh, it's not very easy i mean it's close to being very easy in my opinion but i could definitely see how people being pulled in different fronts and directions would be overwhelming so that's where I'm kind of giving it the benefit of, of the doubt and listing it as an easy difficulty rating. Uh, it's not the single easiest faction on the campaign, but it's definitely probably in the top three or top five of the easiest factions to play for single player against the AI. Uh, playing against another player or in online battles and all that is an entirely different matter, which we'll have to talk about in the future. But anyway, I really hope you guys have enjoyed this faction overview. I hope it's proven to be helpful to you all and perhaps inspired you to pick up the Roman faction yet again, choose whatever family it is that you would like to play as, and begin conquering yet again for Rome. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for watching, hope you guys enjoyed, and I shall see you in the next one.